Ticket Volume is proud to bring you another ITIL co-author, consultant trainer with a dizzying speaking schedule. You should check out his LinkedIn. He's got several advisory and ambassador stints at various organizations and a strong tenure of operations development and IT roles. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and this podcast is powered by Invigate, a global leader in IT service and asset management software. As you know, every week I chat with different IT leaders to share insights on service management, technology, and business, and this episode is no exception. But before we start, consider DMing me, commenting, send us some ideas, Hopefully some other people will be able to find us too. Now let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Mr. Mark Smalley. Yet another co-author of I Two Books. <laughs> You're getting the usual suspects in. And, but delightfully, other new faces as well, which is good, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah that's what it's all about. And I feel so lucky to have all these people in my network. Um, you know, the thing I'm always trying to get across is that there is no ivory tower reach out to people. We love talking about this stuff. Uh, people are humble, especially authors, because the writing process has humbled them. So um, there is no ivory tower. Yeah, it yeah, certainly has. Certainly has. It, uh, it does something with you, writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so lucky to have you here today, because it's not every day that you get to read a book and then grill the author. So <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you for your contributions to ITIL 4. It's so much easier to defend ITIL 4 than it is V3. We've grown. So thank you for High Velocity IT, which I think is your primary contribution to ITIL 4, right? Yeah, correct. I got involved halfway, certainly in the second half of writing Foundation, the first book. Axelos asked me and Christian Nissen as well to join the, I think it's called the architectural team, something like that, to, to reflect on what they'd done so far, uh, contributed a little bit to that. And then nice. they asked me, would you be interesting, it, blame, blame, if you want to blame somebody, blame Roman Zhurilev. Okay. You know, he's the, he's the guy who, who suggested that I might be, uh, the, the guy without any ITIL certification, the ideal qualification to write an <laughs> ITIL book. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> I love that. It is a good idea. Actually, you get a lot of outside perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I don't regard myself as a core IT service management person. Um, I, I started off in the application development area, application mm. development management, and sort of rolled into into IT management and IT service management much later. So I've always, well, mind you, I sort of felt an imposter in all the places I've worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's what makes us good. I mean, I I always like it when we've got new staff joining. They've always got fresh ideas. They're looking at things from fresh perspectives. It really is quite valuable. And high velocity IT, it's such an important part of getting traditional IT folks to up, up to speed, or or should I say, velocity, right? Because speed and velocity are not the same thing. No, that, um, no that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a, as as you as you mentioned, there's um, we pointed out in the book, velocity. If you sort of look at physics, velocity not only has speed but also has direction as a component. So it's you know, doing the right thing, really. That's how we translate it. It's such a good point because you can race to the bottom <laughs> if you want to, but velocity is the yeah. right direction. Well, that's, that's one. If we, if we dive into the content of high velocity IT, one of the things I'm really proud of and have found useful myself is the five objectives that we, uh, we identified. And I, I used them yesterday at a conference in Stockholm for IT service, uh, for ITSMF. They're asking them, you know, what's, what's your weakest link? And I give them five choices. One, one is, uh, are you doing the right thing? Are you making valuable investments? Mm -hmm. Are you automating the right business processes? Are you investing in the right digital products and services? So that's really mm -hmm. the direction. Are you doing the right thing? Are you doing it quickly? That's the second one. Are the systems resilient? So you have minimum disruption to business operations when, not if, when the system fails, because it will fail. It's a complex system. Fourthly, are you concerned with assurance to governance, risk, and compliance requirements, which nobody is, by the way. 
Right. Oh, sorry, that's fit, that was the fifth one. And the fourth, the fourth one, which is always the top scorer, I've done this about 15, 16 times over two years, these polls, Con the consistent high score is co-created value. Are you, as an IT service provider, co-creating value together with the service consumers, the end users? Because it's only when they use the service and products well that any value gets gets created. Otherwise, you know, you make the best car in the world, but if nobody's driving it, or if they're driving it in the wrong direction, you missed the point. Yes, precisely. And there's so many good nuggets in there. One of the best parts of HVIT, or high velocity IT, is that you go all the way back to just understanding that the information is informing decisions. But I'm, I'm really curious, Mark, what inspired you to write a a reflection on high velocity IT. It's sort of part of the traumatic process of, of giving birth to a. Well, it's, it's strange, really. It, it, although I regard it as my baby, the book, um, I, I, I wrote about half of it. 22 mm. other co authors wrote the other half. I spoke with 50 people in total, asking people's opinions what kind of book do you think this should be? So I was the chief orchestrator, uh, making sure the bits and pieces fitted, slotted in, in together. It's our baby. But I mm. felt very much like a surrogate mother bearing this baby because it was Axelos's idea. It was their title. They engaged me to write, write a book for us. So you, you bear the book and then you give it to the, <laughs> give it to the adoptive parents and then you just got to keep your fingers crossed that they send it to the right school, bring it up the right mm. way, right kind of morals. Mm -hmm. So in order to get over that um, that trauma, I wrote a book about the book called Reflections on High Velocity IT. So I wrote bits of the content which either occurred to me after the deadline had closed or didn't, didn't make the cut. Because they asked for 60,000 words. I gave them 90,000 but I'd packaged it in 60,000, which you could publish, and 30,000 other words, which could be published as separate things. Some weren't, some were, some weren't. That's fine. Anyway, some of the content and additional contents in the book, how the book came about, and it was really, it was, um, it was, it was just fun to do. I got a T-shirt made, by the way, a T-shirt with a book on it, printed on the book. Then I got a photo of me holding the book about the book, wearing the T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of a recursive, recursive kind of thing. And the, it, was, it was interesting, writing the book about the book and self-publishing it on Amazon was great fun. That's if anybody's interested and wants to publish a book, it's very easy to... It, it, you sort of get to get, got to get used to their system, but it's, it's pretty easy to do. And the great thing if you self-publish on Amazon is that you get, if you stay within their standard parameters you get 70, 70% royalties as opposed to 15, maybe 20 you'd get from a regular publisher. Uh, of course, you have to do the marketing yourself. But it's, uh, no, it's, it's great fun. And I, after, and after writing that first book, I wrote two other books, Reflections on IT Paradigmology. Because mm -hmm. I call myself the IT paradigmologist, somebody who studies IT paradigms like DevOps and IT service management. Mm -hmm. And the, the final book, the little green one up there, you can see them all nicely lined up very strategically, is, um, is Product to Value. And I'm sure many of your listeners will, he will have heard of Project to Product, Mick Kirsten's book, where he talks about the shift from big temporary project constructions more to permanent product teams. I checked with him on this. He said, yeah, we, we sort of stop when the product has been delivered. And I'm interested in what happens afterwards. So how do you get value out of the product? That, and that's what you referred to earlier, you know, that sort of co-creation stuff. Yes. So anyway, so Amazon's a great vehicle for budding publishers. Good fun. Excellent. Yes. And I do want to hit on some of those topics that you're trying to get that I think you maybe got missed. I haven't actually read the entire high velocity IT, like the ITIL 4 book yet, just your reflections. So let's talk about some of those things because you call them out in your book. Yeah, sure. Mark Burgess's promise theory. What is this? 
We said this is from the start. This is not going to be comprehensive. It is not going to be prescriptive, it telling people be. what to do, but right. give them, give them a, a kind of a guided tour th through high velocity IT country. Think about a road tour where you st stop from time to time at a scenic lookout. Stop out of the car, look around for a while, take a couple of pictures, and you see stuff. Stuff you don't see everything, but it gives you an impression of the landscape. So what we wanted to do with high velocity IT was pick some some typical stereotypical examples of what you come across in these kind of organisations. Some might be useful for you, some might not. They might trigger some thoughts. If they do, study a bit deeper, see how it works for you. And one of the things that we could have included in the book is promise theory. Um, and Mark, Bur a clever guy, Mark Burgess, really, really clever. He talks about sort of realizing that people people promise stuff, but will the promise actually happen? Will it be mm -hmm. fulfilled? Differences between promises and obligations. He's, he's um, he talks. He, he's written a fair bit of it, spoken about it a lot. Look it up on Google. It give, it gets you thinking about the 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 nature of contracts, the nature of how people agreements, how people mm -hmm. not necessarily contracts, nature of agreements, how people work with each other, collaborate. There are more people who can't make promises or can't keep them than those who can. Mm. There are more people who can't make or can't keep promises than those who can. Wow. It's just real <laughs> life. You know, people, people struggle. You know, can you commit to something? No, nah, I can't do that. Or either they, so either they can't commit at all or they do and they, they don't come up with the goods. <laughs> it's a pretty yeah. dismal view of life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, parts of life are they've they've got to be depressing because you need the yin and the yang. You need the depressing negative parts because otherwise, no. you know, when when you get those good promises, you won't recognize them. Otherwise, there wouldn't be Zen Buddhism, which is bingo recognizing <laughs> suffering as the key element in life. Bingo, man! Yeah. <laughs> the older I get, the more I feel it. <laughs> Uh, so that's great. I also really like the, there's these two behaviors that you call out in the book and neither of them really even look like IT behaviors um, or they're, they're not something that we talk about con consistently. Yeah. No one ever sits you down and says, hey, you're in IT now. You're going to have to continually learn and improve and choose to do ethically the right thing. Those two behaviors that you call out, I really like them um, because it's not something that I, I know they weren't in V3. And it's not something that someone that, that we talk about often enough, in my opinion, that you, this is something you are going to need to do. That yeah. changes changes consistent in IT and therefore you as a human, y your goal is to continually learn and improve. Can you tell me what inspired those those behavior choices that, to include those in the book? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was thinking about what constitutes meaningful and rewarding work. And what I wasn't thinking about was the great resignation. We came up with what we ended up calling key behavior patterns, which I'm not sure whether I wanted it at the time, but I would now call them aspirations, mm -hmm. the kind of things that people aspire to. And I'm not saying that these these aspirations are necessarily aspirations that will attract people for you, but it, just getting you to think about what would attract our kind of people. And the the ones you mentioned, uh, continuing improvement and learning, learning and improvement and, and doing the ethically right thing, I'd add as an, another key one, trust and be trusted, the desire, the aspiration, the desire to trust and be trusted in the workplace. Referring to very strongly to psychological safety, whether you feel comfortable bringing your personal values to work or whether you feel you have to leave them at the door um, whether you fear for your position or reputation at work when you bring up a you know it's a difficult point you criticize you criticizing somebody Is somebody open for criticism some organizations are some aren't it's really just making people aware you know the only thing you can do with a presentation or a book is get people to see things that they hadn't seen previously, so new things, 
or get them to look at existing things from a slightly different perspective. Yeah, that's that's all I can do. And <laughs> that's, it's up to you. <laughs> good, good luck. <laughs> Meet me halfway. Meet me halfway. Good, that's good. why I love that metaphor that you have about traveling. It really is like, <clears throat> just look around, get a new perspective on life, and then take it back to your life and, and yeah. see and how you're going to apply yep, yep, yep. it. But the, the key thing is, and what do you do when you get back to work? You know, you've gone to a course, you've read a book, gone to a conference, you get back to work the next day. What are you going to do with it? Do you have do you have the, the continual learning and improvement? Do you have the bandwidth? And it's not only that does your manager give you the time to do it, but think about cognitive load, a term that's being used recently quite a lot. Being aware of you know my head's too full of stuff. I simply can't even if if my manager gives me a half a day a week to think about stuff. My head is too full with other stuff. I simply can't deal with it. I can't do any, make any significant improvement. So you've got that aspect. Then you've got just human nature. Some people are more, more comfortable with, with, how th- with inertia, with how things are, and some, uh, some less so. Um, so there's a lot of difference in, in there. And it's, you know, it's, 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 do you have that vibrancy at work? Is there vitality? I used the, the term, I thought that the Swedish are pretty liberal people. I can use, use the term. I coined the term organizational eroticism. Mm. Organize and eroticism as the, 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 anti, the, the, as the, the, the key to that mystical quality of, of vitality and vibrancy. And I said, if you if you look around, look around yourself, look at a worker at home, you you come across, you can see two kinds of people. You can see people who are alive, who are vibrant, and you can see people who are not dead. Yes. <laughs> and you can you can now I can see you visualizing a person who is not dead. And of course, it's not binary. It's not either or. No. There's, there's a there's a spectrum, but it's how much energy is there in the organisation to actually get things get things changing, and that's mm-hmm. you've got to realise. Lots of people we talk, you know, we're weird kind of people, Matt. We we talk about crazy stuff when we talk at conferences or like this. We talk about disrupting the marketplace. To be frank, most people, most organizations are happy if they are not being disrupted. It's probably 80%. Mm-hmm. For just a few people who are, who are thinking, you know, we're going to disrupt the marketplace. Others are just trying to survive, trying to make a living. Yeah. And, and we have to be cautious with, with the kind, the weird kind of stuff. And certainly this high velocity IT book, I think it's the, the weirdest idle book that's ever been published. I'm proud to say so. <laughs> I love it. I love that you say that about your own book. It's yeah, kind of yeah it's, it's a weird, weird kind of stuff, but it's 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 for certain kind of people. Something that I keep seeing over and over and over: the the fun at work, psychological safety at work. And I follow a lot of people, and I'm really interested in employee experience because it's something that IT has been providing for decades. And what I'm realizing is that so many people who are involved in those projects are trying to command and control. How can we operationalize employee experience? How do we policy employee experience? And what I'm realizing is that part of that is because they they don't feel like they have power in their people managers. There's this middle management idea of what middle management is, this bloated area where people are heavily driven on metrics and performance and meeting their goals when really the people managers are the front line to that employee experience. They're the ones that if you give them a little breathing space, they can build things like trust. They can add things like fun and play into work as long as you're hiring the right people in those roles and giving them the tools to to do those things. And I'm wondering if you're thinking along the same lines. Does that sound like where employee experience is going, or am I way off base? We we often say if you want happy customers, you've you've got to get happy employees first. Mm. It starts with that. You could extend that slightly. I'm not sure whether it's right, but if you want happy happy employees, you might need happy managers. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Love it. So uh, then you extend the chain even further. So you want want happy stakeholder, happy shareholders, or something. yeah, that's true. Can't yeah. we all be happy? I mean, there's going to be yin and yang, right? We no. have to do the work but, we don't like too. No, but there is, but there there is something that that holds me back from following that, following up on that line, and that's um, going back a couple of centuries. Well, I think four or five centuries, Machiavelli. Going back to to 15, 1532, I think when he published *The Prince*, um, he's great. He's wonderful. You know, read read that book. It's absolutely mm-hmm. br- a brilliant insight into human nature. He's 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 talking about a prince, but it's equally applicable to managers. He said, "A, a manager, a prince, can't determine the happiness of of their employees, of the population. They can only make them miserable." As a manager, as a prince, you can you have the power to make people miserable. They will decide for themselves whether they are happy. The only thing you can do is create the conditions. So that's wow. that, so that's you know c- command and control works just for misery. So yes. I think we we need an alternative for or something in parallel for for ha- for happiness. And it's yeah. it's it's weird. I mean, thinking about experience, customer experience, supplier experience, employee. Uh, recently, and building on the work, I'm sure many of the listeners, you know, you're in the service business if you're listening, I expect, uh, many listeners will be familiar with service dominant logic, which is the, the kind of way service organizations work, either consciously or unconsciously, and it differs pretty significantly from goods dominant logic, which was the way that the manufacturing industry worked with com- command and control. Because things, factory lines, could be commanded and controlled. So cybernetics and um, low variation is good. Whereas where there's high linear causality between things, you've got root causes to stuff. In service work, in knowledge work, it's not the case. There's, there's much less linear causality. There's much more emergent behavior. That things just happen, influenced by multiple factors. And the you know human beings, each human being, each each person experiences a service individually, uniquely. If we you know if we both go to a shop, uh, we'll have different experiences. Even though you'd you'd think we'd have the same no because we're different. Mm-hmm. I got up on the wrong side of the bed, things like that. <laughs> and each each time each time you have an experience when you go to the shop for the 10th time you will have a different experience than the first time because the first time you're a little bit nervous about who are these people here how does it work here are they going to rip me off um so and that that's very neatly very uh, tersely formulated in the 10th foundational principle of service dominant logic value from service is unique and and phenomenological which is a wonderful mm-hmm. word to interject into conversation, which means it's about experience. It's how you experience it, and i i did a I did a riff on that. Um, it's called experience dominant logic. One of my recent LinkedIn articles, where I've I'm talking to a couple of guys in in um, the day before yesterday in Stockholm at, at the university there. They 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 seemed interested in it, in it as well. So I'm exploring where this will go but it's is thinking about sort of starting with the premise that that human beings want emotional well-being you know mm-hmm. sort of basic maslov kind of thing you want to feel yeah. happy second second principle is is that service affects your emotions third is that service providers should therefore pay considerable attention to the experience component in service because it's about human beings then further down the line, I've got twelve of these these foundational premises. Um, th- then you sort of end up with at, at the end at the end of the road. Yeah, but how do we measure this stuff? Because if it's subjective, and if people are different, uh, how do we do that? So it's it's although you can measure some stuff, you have to be continuously checking the hypotheses if whether they work, whether they're changing, whether they, but. Even if you don't succeed in measuring it well, the fact that you are engaging with customers is is also an experience. So people see that you're doing your best. 
which is often if if you if you've got two experiences people produce the exact rationally speaking the ex the same rational results but you can see clearly that one person is working in difficult circumstances they've done their utmost to make it work for you and the other person doesn't seem to care but they come up with the same results you know you think the, the first first person is great they like they cared for me they they love me they love me but so they, it's that's and that that's that triggers a little thought this is going going back to adam smith's less famous work uh, about, about moral sentiments um, he says man desires to be loved and to be lovely mm. to be loved and to be lovely what he means by lovely and this could take us down a, another track maybe another podcast is deserving of love lovely mm. so having done the right thing and people are sensitive to that <laughs> yeah because it be, feels like a judgment loved. yeah to be loved and to be lovely I uh, love it. That's, it's that's the theory nice, of moral that's, sentiments. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, that's that's the one. That's the one. Wow, that's good stuff. But I do <laughs> like this other concept that I wanted to point out. Yeah, the operating model canvas. Um, you mentioned it just briefly uh, in your in your reflections book, and then you show some good imagery around it. And I think it is such a good model. I think it is such a good way to think about value streams too, because value stream mapping, it's still you know, I want everyone to know what it is and I want people to be experienced with it and feel comfortable with it, but it just doesn't seem as accessible as some of the other tools that we've got in our tool belt. So talk about a little bit, a little bit about operating model canvas. Where did it come from? Where do you see it sitting in HVIT? Yeah, right, 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 right. It's, uh, it's, it's possibly one of the missing links in the book, something that isn't in, the, well, it's mentioned in the book, but the book is not actually about changing stuff. It paints a picture of what your future organization might, I was going to say look like, but I might better say feel like. Mm -hmm. It's a metaphor I haven't used previously. I'm holding up Andrew Campbell's book to the microphone so the listeners can take a good look at it. <laughs> It's um, it, it's a fabulous book. Look it up online. It's published by Van Haren Publishing, VHP. Um, but if you look on uh, operatingmodelcanvas.com, that's Andrew Campbell, the main author of the book. That's where he he's sh shares plenty of stuff for free. So you get, um, you get lots of free content. W what he says is... Um, you, you may be familiar with the business model canvas. That may, mm -hmm. That's probably more widely known. Uh, Alex Osterwalder and colleagues wrote that. And that, that shows the whole, what, what the whole organization does. And in, the, in the middle, you've got the value propositions, the products and the services that the organization produces. On the right-hand side of the model, you've got how you engage with the market. On the left-hand side of the model, you've got the key activities, key resources, key partners, the people and things that you need to actually produce, deliver the value propositions. Mm -hmm. And that left-hand side, that what Andrew calls the back end of the, oper of the business model, is, is the operating model. That's how you, how you do stuff. Yes. It's not how you sell it, but it's how, but how you do stuff. And what Andrew did is he says that three, the, the key activities, resources, and partners that deserves a little bit more detail. So he said, think about the following six boxes. And he abbreviates them as POLISM, P-O-L-I-S-M. P stands for process and value chains, which I call value streams, but I'm quibbling a bit there. It's about the activities, what you do, what you yeah. do. The O is for organization and people. Who do you need? How do you structure the organization? What kind of skills, competences do you need? The L is for locations and assets buildings, machinery, you know, big kind of assets, uh, geographical spread across the world, for instance, or even house an organization in a certain location. Are, are people on the first floor and the second floor not communicating with each other or are they on the same floor, for instance? That could be a, a locational concern. The uh, I is for information and technology, the information that you need in the processes and value streams to get things done. Uh, the S is for suppliers and partners and how you engage them. 
And it gets you thinking about what should we do ourselves? What, what should others do? Your key core competencies. And finally, the M is for the underlying or overarching management system that manages performance and mm -hmm. improvement. And these six boxes, which he's, he's drawn in a neat little diagram, what he says is draw that on a, on a whiteboard, get sticky notes, post-its, write down the, the crucial things that are really important, things that are troubling you, stick them on there and discuss it. And you can, you can, you can depict this it's a visualization of how you do stuff. You can depict this as a, as a big one pager at a high level, but you could also do an operating model uh, really detailed in 100 pages. So it's an instrument to visualize either what you're doing today or what you want to do tomorrow so that you can think about how you can how you can get there. It's great it's a great uh, great tool. Yeah, I love it. It's a it it's high level enough that you can um, put a lot of your worries into one place and just like a lot of tools like this you don't want to boil the ocean. Make sure you're not building too big of a sandwich. You got to eat it eventually. So it's all about setting those limits, understanding which of those post-its you're actually going to take down and address. Yeah, and, and Andrew's a very knowledgeable, not only very knowledgeable, very clever guy, but he's, he's, a, he's a great supportive guy as well. If you were to reach out for him with a specific question, certainly if you buy his book, he'd... <laughs> But even if you don't, he'd he'd be happy to reflect on, on any 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 uh, d dilemmas that you have. So it's um, no, he's a, he's a he's a joy, Andrew. And you as well, Mark. Thank you so much for being on Ticket Volume. My pleasure. So where can people connect with you and learn more? Uh, I publish most of my stuff on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Keep an eye on the posts. If you're uh, if you're on Twitter, I'm there as well, Mark Smalley. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is the best place. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for taking some time to be with us today, Mark. Thank you. And to our audience, what did you like about this episode? We're gonna keep running these, so the power is in your hands. Tell us who you want to get on, what topics you want covered, or just say hi, so that the algorithms will give me some credit. This podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support. If you're looking for a solution to help your help desk with headaches or year-long implementations, you're going to love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so they can focus on delivering the best service possible. Thanks for hitting play, and I'll see you around the way. Yeah.